Hey, it's me, Carolyn Glick. Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour with my co-host, Gadi Tab. Hey, Gadi. Hello from Tel Aviv. Hi. So uh, what should we talk about today? I have an idea. You want to hear what it is? Yeah, sure. Okay. I think we should talk about two things. I think one of the things that we have to talk about is... Uh, our wonderful foreign minister and alternate and, and soon to become prime minister, Yair Lapid, and his marvelous travels in Washington, along with the parting visit of Israel's greatest friend, Angela Merkel, here in Jerusalem at the beginning of the week. And then we, I think we should move to the uh, to Do you the think everyone War. got the irony, though, Caroline? I, I well, got now it. they did. Now they did. <laughs> now they, now did. they did. Now yeah, I was okay. being ironical. Yeah. <laughs> but you, uh, you know the pool law. Po, 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 po. It's a, 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 a bear. It the law says that anything you post on the internet that you think is ironic would be taken literally. I see. Well, I guess this is a web web. What do we call this? A webcast. So that means that people won't realize that I'm being ironic. So it's a good thing we have you here, right, Kimasabi? Anyways, <laughs> oh, I'm not allowed to say that either. Uh, anyways. Um, but what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So um, that was one of the things. And then the second thing I thought we could we could do is is uh, talk to you as our as our uh, fearless leader uh, in this. Uh, yes. In the in this <laughs> in this internecine civil war in the in the on the right that you're uh, on Twitter and uh, and uh, what's happening there, I think it's a very important thing to talk about because what's happening here really does, uh, in a lot of ways, um, it's, it, it, it echoes and it resonates what's happening in the United States in the sort of civil war between the establishment Republicans and, uh, and the normal Republicans. <laughs> and the actual conservatives. <laughs> And the actual conservatives, yes, uh, who aren't allowed to call themselves conservatives. But uh, I saw I saw just uh, one of my new heroines, uh, Julie Kelly from uh, from American Greatness, who's been the intrepid uh, 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 reporter covering covering the persecution of all of the loyal Americans who showed up at Capitol Hill on July on January 6th. So she said uh, that uh, Trump supporters shouldn't call themselves conservatives anymore. And. I thought that that was a tragedy because there's nothing wrong with being conservative. Uh, the problem is that it's being used just like democracy and, de uh, you know, Democrats or whatever is being used by people who are anti-democratic is the people who say that their conservatives aren't actually that anymore. So anyway, you're leading the uh, you're you're one of the most outspoken um, uh, people Critics of the on, Israeli rhinos. Right. Right. Exactly. The, Israel's version of the rhinos. So I want to talk about that, too. But let's let's open with our with our dear leader, uh, Yair Lapid, and, and our other dear leader, what's his name, uh, Naftali Bennett, uh, as they lead us down the garden path with everything having to do with Israel foreign policy. Um, should we start with our best friend, Merkel? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just want to say as, as a way of introduction that Lapid is a danger, not just to the interests of Israel, but to what you started saying about the use of words, democracy, conservatives. He is corrupting the meaning of words, because this is we, we there was nothing like that in the history of Israel. This is a guy who's I think he was mocked by the left for years for being hollow, for being this hot air balloon, which just spouting uh, cliches and 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 what is happening with if you if you only use cliches is that you corrupt the meaning of the meaning of words and now since I write fiction so and if you don't mind my starting with such a uh, off topic or off uh, left field with this with this discussion of Yair Lapid is that you know I I read Raymond Carver the, the great American author and in one of his stories uh, a woman loses her child, and and she and when the, she's told that he's dead, she she said, "Oh no, I can't leave him here." And then she stops and she says, and and he says, the narrator says, she she that she I don't remember the exact phrase. She heard the words out of her mouth and they offended her because they sounded like TV soaps. So what these people are doing to us, they are stealing the meaning of words in the way that, you know, you cannot say I love you anymore because you've seen this sentence on so many soaps that if you don't add a, an ironic twist, it doesn't have any meaning anymore. So Yair Lapid is 
this is what he's doing. All this pompous talk. You remember how he talked about the end of democracy when it was Netanyahu. These people are, and 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 this is. And you will say something about his the way he received Merkel. But just today, I got from a friend in America that he said that Kamala Harris Harris is Israel's best Israel's friend on in Washington or something like that. That's last week we talked for forty minutes about how she how she thought that student has the right to her truth with with saying that Israel is committing genocide. So that's my well, introduction here, I, to Lapid. I, yeah, I think, and I think we have to go back to Lapid because one of the problems that you're discussing here is uh, emptying words of meaning uh, really goes to the heart of how the right wing, how people who are nationalists in Israel should be treating the government. And that's really the heart of, of what the argument here is surrounding this government. But uh, let's let's end with that. And let's start really with Lapid, because I think, I mean, we saw sort of, uh, and this, of course, is the uh, is the substance of the article that I just finished writing for Israel Hayom, which everybody will be able to see on my website in English as well. On Friday, I'll post it there and on Israel Hayom's English website. But having said that, um, there were three. We've had a very busy uh, diplomatic week this week. It started with Merkel's uh, parting visit in Israel. It went on with this incredible agreement, agreement, this historic agreement that Israel signed with Jordan yesterday uh, to double the supply of essentially free water that Israel is giving them from uh, from the Sea of Galilee. And then it was capped off uh, yesterday and today with uh, the Svengali of Israeli diplomacy, Yair Lapid's uh, courageous and important visit to Washington, D.C., where he applauded Kamala Harris, the lover of, of, uh, of blood libel purveyors, as Israel's great friend. You know, so I think we should we I, I think I think we should talk about that. Um, and at first, I want to start with Merkel. Because, but, but just this, because just because you said Jordan, I'm interrupting you today. Just you keep he, doing it. Huh? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. This is what? what I think our audience are waiting for. How will he yeah. interrupt her? Throw her right. They want to know whether <laughs> how much how much how much screen time God is going to manage to steal from Ladmouth Carolyn this week. Yeah, go on, go on, go on. So he tweeted that we have doubled the, the water supply to Jordan because double sounds better, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like you've just given up more water for nothing. We had leverage nothing. on Jordan. And you're sh so yeah well yeah Merkel. you're you're pissing it away but and and the worst thing about it is that Israel does have a water shortage we have a, you know there it it causes ecological destruction to Israel that we're transferring all of this water because it changes the whole balance of the of the streaming of the of the rivers of the of the Jordan River into the Sea of Galilee and it causes a lot of extra pollution and there's a friend of mine who's uh, who's an, who knows a lot about ecology you know I'm too uh, general uh, uh, Gershon Akon was telling me about this this morning when I called him up to find out about the deal. But um, yeah, everything is everything is a slogan. Everything is about PR. I mean, and and just to sort of um, digress back to your initial digression about Yair Lapid, just so just so you guys understand, you know, we've been living with Lapid since he was a teenager here in Israel um, because his father. And his mother were big uh, muckety mucks uh, in uh, Israeli journalism and literature. I mean, his mother uh, was a uh, was an author and and I think a literature professor, right? Is that? I'm, I'm not sure. Lapid? I'm not sure, but she was a she was a well known established author. Yeah, I mean, she wrote she wrote these uh, novels that I read when I was in Ulpan. It was easy Hebrew, very popular literature, um, and they were good. And his father was the general director of Israel Television, Tommy Lapid. And afterwards, he went into politics. He was on. He was a television personality for many years. And, and he, was, he was minister of justice. And right. And then he formed the Shinui Party, which is an anti-Orthodox party. And he joined, I think, two different governments. And he was a minister of justice. And he, I think he was a minister of commerce. So anyway, he was a he was a he was a very. A big celebrity. The Lapids were sort of celebrities in Israeli celebrity culture before there was a celebrity culture. And Yair was their son, and he grew up with that. And he never had to prove himself. He dropped out of high school, and yet he got to be a reporter in in the IDF's uh, newspaper, which only, you know, uh, fancy pants people could be instead of having normal military service. 
Um, and, and then he, he got... invented another military service for himself. He kept telling stories about his military service. I think one of them was that he was he joined the uh, the, uh, the Lebanon invasion and he was on a jeep with two officers and he got off the jeep to take a piss and a mortar fell on the jeep and killed the two other officers. And then someone checked the story. There's no such story. Nobody knows about two killed Well, so then he has a lot in common with Biden because yeah, Biden, yeah. Uh, Biden oh, has Shulamit also Lapid. created- He's writing fiction, yeah. Right. I mean, no, but no, but Biden himself has created multiple life stories for himself that he passes off. You know, I think he was in he was in uh, he was in prison with Nelson Mandela. And, you know, he he was with and the his invading father forces told him at Normandy. Love is love. His father <laughs> you know? showed him and this. I'd love to see this. Right. Scene. His father All right. Showed and him his father two men kissing the... and said love is love. That was the 60s. Right. Biden's father. Right. Yeah. Right. And we all believe that. So, no. So Yair Lapid and, and Biden should get along famously at any rate. So um, so in many ways, Lapid was sort of the original reality television person because his family was a public family and, and everybody sort of knew about him since he was a kid. Then he got a television show when he was a personality. He got to be on all these these uh, hit movies as a as an actor and sort of. Uh, the bonton of Israeli uh, culture let him do essentially anything that he wanted because he was Tommy's kid. It was never really that. And, and, and the thing that he was very good at was trivializing everything, was these one-liners that he could put out, you know, 10 things that you didn't know about Gadi Taub. And then he would, you know, go off and, you know, steal things with David Letterman that way. But whatever, I mean, he had all of these kinds of shticks that everybody liked. And then he decided that he wanted to be prime minister. So he started a party and everybody was behind him, all of the television, all of his friends from television, all of his friends from uh, PR and everything else. And this is sort of how he's a creation of Israel's ruling class. And his life has never been subjected to any serious to serious judgment because he's he's lived this kind of gilded uh, life. And he, and he has all these connections. And we might also mention that in his party, it says in the party what, what what is it a covenant no it's a constitution constitution whatever it, it says that he's the head of the party and can't be replaced and that was it's like a dictatorship and so that that had a time limit and it was about to expire so the little duce uh, changed the rules and made himself a leader of the, it's like a, it's a democracy in the sense that abu mazin has a democracy and or putin, putin or has a democracy or Erdogan has a democracy yeah Whatever. So, but anyway, so Merkel, the same Bonton that has been pushing Lapid as this as this brilliant guy, even though he's totally uneducated and, and shallow, um, has also been pushing for years this idea that Western German, what Western uh, European countries, uh, particularly Germany and France are and and Britain are great friends of Israel, even though they've been opposed to Israel since the mid nineteen sixties, and increasingly so. Uh, and Merkel has been upheld as this incredibly friendly uh, chancellor and this great, you know, and and uh, she's a fighter against anti-Semitism. And none of this is true. Angela Merkel is, is uh, has been the head of uh, Germany for 16 years. And during the time that she's been at the helm, uh, Germany has acted as Iran's principal guardian and sponsor and trade partner in Europe. They protected its nuclear program. They've they've uh, fought sanctions. They've been the biggest uh, champions of the nuclear deal. They've helped their nuclear program uh, with various uh, dual use uh, uh, technologies that they've that they've given to the to to the Iranians, often in breach of sanctions. Um, and so on and so forth. And then in regards to Israel and the Palestinians, Germany uh, spends more money sponsoring BDS organizations uh, than any other European government. Um, in international forums, uh, they, they vote lockstep against Israel and for every condemnation of Israel. So this is, this is Merkel's record. Um, she's empowered anti-Semites from the far left to the far right. And of course, she opened up the floodgates to Europe for Muslim anti-Semites that brought both jihad and massive increases in Jew hatred to the shores of Europe from 2015 on. So this is a woman who's, who's, 
whose record on Israel and on Jews is mixed only uh, when you give equal weight to her lip service that she's paid to Israel and to Jews as you do to her actions. And um, so that, of course, is what the left always does for, for people who are opposed to Israel. And therefore, they've been kissing her boots since she came into office as a woman chancellor, as a woman, 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 you know, 16 years ago. And Naftali Bennett, even said, and this is for this is a cringe moment for any Israeli, I guess, for any Jew anywhere. He said that Germany, Merkel's Germany, is the moral compass of Europe. The right. moral compass. Germany, seventy well, years after he, the Holocaust. And in a way, in a way, he's right. You know, I mean, to the extent that <laughs> yeah. that you know, a new study of anti-Semitism in thirty countries in Europe just came out and said that they all pretty much hate us. You could say, yeah. Yeah, but, she is a moral compass. But they don't all hate us, at least not the governments. And the, the Vishgrad governments are our allies. And Lapid is undermining all our alliances with them. Um, first, they've, they've stained Oban, this whole, the whole rhetoric that says that Oban is a fascist and that he, he's turning uh, Hungary into a dictatorship and all that. But Yair Lapid has made a an issue of a Polish law about the ability to return some uh, of the uh, sur Holocaust survivors' um, uh, property. The law is apparently marginal and will only affect anyone only through big organizations. I don't know all the details, but yeah, but but this is when when Poland is our our, our best ally in the European Union, and they veto. Uh, decisions against us. He's made a whole thing. It's, he's never going to forgive Poland for the Holocaust, and he's kissing Angela Merkel's boots. It's, well, it's, it's not like, just it's it's not just that. It's actually even more amazing because actually Germany and and France have similar laws to the ones that have uh, raised the ire of of uh, Lapid and all of his uh, progressive friends in the United States. So, I mean, this is this is the most ridiculous thing. But in keeping with that. Right. So uh, Lapid and Naftali Bennett um, invited Merkel to have a parting visit to Israel before she gets out of office. And I think that here this is what's most remarkable. You know, Merkel, like I said, has a viciously anti-Israel record and a viciously you know, anti-Jewish record in terms of her empowering anti-Semites all over Europe and specifically in Germany for the past 16 years. But or maybe not 16. I think she started off much better than she ended up. But having said that, um, they didn't have to do that. I mean, you know, for most of the time that she was the chancellor, Israel does not have any interest in provoking a fight with Germany. A lot of people don't like what Germany is doing. I mean, the Hungarians can't stand Germany on so many different levels, but they are Israel's largest trading partner in Europe, and they're also Hungary's largest trading partner. So they carry around a lot of weight. And by the way, the Americans don't really want to get into a fight with Germany because they control the European Union. So for all of these reasons, you know, nobody wants to provoke a crisis in relations, whether it's Jerusalem or Budapest or Prague or anywhere else or Warsaw. But um that's when she's in power. So you want to be nice to her and say she's Israel's greatest friend in Europe, just as, you know, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu said that Obama is the best uh, friend Israel ever had in the White House. Everybody knew he, he was, was lying. He actually spoke warmly about Angela Merkel, too, but he was but but that was also followed by an insistence on our interests and a, and a, right. a, a so, severe critique of her support of the, the uh, JCPOA. And, and of the Palestinian BDS organizations. But, and he also canceled a visit with Hans Steinermeiner, who I think was either the foreign minister or the president at the it time. Was, of, it uh, was a Zygmar, what's, uh, I forget his name. No, it's it, Zygmar Gabriel. He was the foreign minister and whatever. he came here. Whatever, yeah, these right, Germans. Right, and he's very, <laughs> and, right, you remember better than no, no, I remember because I wrote, no, I don't mean because I wrote though, a piece but, you know. in English about this. Maybe we can post it under the video. Uh, I wrote a piece about this because he came here and he said he would meet uh, Breaking the Silence and B'Tselem, which are human rights organizations. Basically, what they do is less deal with human rights than with, with defaming Israel and blood libels. And, he, and, and Netanyahu said, if you meet them, you're not going to meet me. And he said, OK, I'll meet them and not you. So there you go. And that that was Merkel's Germany. foreign minister. Right. And that's Germany. And that's Merkel's foreign ministry. So the minister. So so the point is that, you know, 
Netanyahu uh, always paid lip service to her because he had to, just as he always paid lip service to Obama because he had to. But the thing is that she's leaving office. So the need to pay lip service to her is no longer existent. Nobody needs to make her feel good about herself, but she can't hurt us anymore because she's leaving. She's not going to be determining policy. By bringing her over to Israel and giving her two days of fun where everybody says what a great what a great leader she was and how much she did for Israel and she did nothing for Israel, she hurt Israel. Um, and um, Israel is signaling to whoever replaces her, and it's still not clear who's going to form the next government, uh, but, it, but it signals to her replacement that they have nothing to fear from screwing us, that we're going we're gonna to lick their boots even when we don't need to anymore. So, I mean, that was what was so absurd that, you know, they did this when we have nothing to gain from this. No Israeli interest is advanced by them sucking up to her. They're only hurt because at this point, we're going to have a, we want, would want to start with a clean slate with the next chancellor who's going to be far less powerful than she is because he's new and she's been there and she's she's over time, just her longevity in office has, has increased her power. Now we're going to have a new guy. And instead of just keeping our distance saying, hey, you know, uh, see ya, you know, see you when I see you, but not if I see you first kind of thing, you know, instead of saying that to her, they say, oh, we love you. You're a great friend of Israel. And she's not. And like you said, Lapid is doing this. And, and obviously Bennett as well is just, you know, doing whatever he says at the same time that he's waging a diplomatic war against the vice guard uh, countries led by Poland, even though, um, whether it's diplomatically at the UN or strategically vis-a-vis -vis Iran, the Poles have stood with Israel and been our strongest and most powerful strategic ally in Europe for the past many years. So he came into office, declared war on Poland. He's continuing his tenure, sucking up to Germany uh, under uh, of Merkel uh, as she's leaving. And this is this is the kind of thing where you're you're empowering Israel's antagonists in exchange for nothing. And again, you know, there are many times where you might want to say something nice in order to get something. Bibi kept saying, you know, Obama's the greatest friend ever that we ever had. And he signed an MOU that provided uh, uh, over a period of 10 years, uh, $3.8 billion in, in military assistance to Israel. Granted, there were a lot of terms of that deal that were terrible, and I thought that we shouldn't have signed it at all. But be that as it may, the left and and people who have been sucking up to Obama all this time would never have been able to secure that kind of deal from him, and, and Netanyahu did. So I think, and by the way, he did it the year after uh, uh, he came to the, the capital and and he spoke to the joint houses against Obama's you know uh, center. So that's the first thing that he did with Merkel, that, that our government did with Merkel. And then came the story with Jordan, which we started to talk about. You know, King Abdallah of Jordan is an enemy of Israel. His father wasn't. His father viewed uh, a Palestinian state as an existential threat uh, to the to the king, to the Hashemite uh, monarchy. You know, the Hashemites aren't Jordanian. They came from Saudi Arabia. They lost they lost Arabia and as a consolation prize, and then they lost Syria. This was after World War one and then as a consolation prize the british gave them transjordan in which they carved out of the palestinian mandate mandate from area that was supposed to be the jewish state and uh, so this was a british creation it has existed throughout its history as a as a basically as a protectorate first of britain and then of israel and the united states um, and uh, king hussein uh, abdallah's father recognized that a palestinian state would be an existential threat to jordan because the majority, the vast majority of Jordanians are ethnic Palestinians, and you know a Palestinian state in uh, in the, in the West Bank of the Jordan would uh, Hussein believed uh, instigate a an overthrow of the Hashemite monarchy on the East Bank of the Jordan River, um, and the and in fact you know in 1970 uh, Yasser Arafat tried to overthrow the Hashemite dynasty, uh, and and King Hussein chucked out the PLO, and that's why they ended up decamping to Lebanon. It was after they tried to overthrow it. But Abdallah has uh, has advanced a policy that is the exact opposite of his father's. He's been advancing a policy. I heard uh, the, the the Islamic scholar Moti Kedar explain that he thinks that he's become like the most uh, outspoken champion, champion of Palestinian statehood, and he's been 
more outspoken or just as outspoken as the PLO in his diplomatic war against Israel and our right to exist in, in international forums throughout the world. He supports Palestinian terrorism. Most recently, he's been trying to get close to Iran. Uh, his foreign minister just uh, had a phone conversation with his Iranian counterpart this week. So he is definitely not a great ally. He tried to block the Abraham Accords. He was opposed to them. He blocked Prime Minister Netanyahu at the time from going and having having his first official visit to the UAE. Uh, I think that was in um, in March before the March elections last year, uh, this year. Um, so, you know, he's he's been horrible to Israel. And and uh, and it's because he thinks that it serves his interests to harm us and to join the war against us. And that's what he's been doing. And um, <clears throat> as a result, he didn't have good relations with Netanyahu because Netanyahu saw this and he said, well, you know, uh, go to hell. And he didn't try to meet him and he didn't try to, you know, uh, uh, and put a good face on what uh, Abdallah was doing. And uh, that was that. Uh, and Naftali Bennett, uh, in the meantime, uh, chose to use the fact that that Abdallah had terrible relations with with Netanyahu as a way to distinguish himself from Netanyahu without uh, directly appeasing the Palestinians. So almost as soon as he came into office, he had this meeting with Abdallah, which was supposed to be secret, but but uh, it wasn't because Bennett leaked it and he leaked pictures of them, I think. And um, and and he said that the reason why Israel had had such bad relations with with Amman with with Abdallah was because Netanyahu was a meanie, and uh, ignored completely the fact that the reason that Israel had bad relations with Abdallah is because Abdallah is hostile to Israel, and has been undercutting Israel at every turn, and has been trying to undercut our relations with the Americans, whether it was under Obama or under Trump, and now under Biden. He's a terrible, terrible ally. He's not an ally. He's giving, you know, he has Alam Tamimi, the bomber from Sparrow from 2001, uh, who, who murdered 15 people, eight of them uh, uh, children, several of them American citizens in the Sparrow suicide bombing in August of 2001. Um, at any rate, this is how terrible Abdallah is. And, and I could go on for another 20 minutes with that pause to just continue enumerating all of the horrible things that he's done. Um, but uh, and 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 those are all the reasons that he and Israel have had bad relations. So instead of recognizing this and holding him to account and working with the Biden administration to try to put pressure on Abdallah to stop being so hostile towards Israel, Naftali Bennett immediately scapegoated Netanyahu, said it was all Netanyahu's fault that we had bad relations with with Jordan and that he was going to fix it. Now, how did he fix it? How is he fixing it? He's not fixing it by, you know, demanding that, like I said, that Abdallah stop. No, he's been giving in to all of Abdallah's demands. So the main thing that he's been doing is, uh, you know, he's been exp expanding uh, the number of Jordanians who can move to uh, Judea and Samaria, which is sort of what people are calling a rolling right of return, which is, means, you know, bringing in millions of foreign born Arabs into uh, into Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Um, <clears throat> and so he's agreed to do that. And uh, most recently this week, uh, the government agreed to double the quantities of water that Israel is giving the uh, the uh, Jordanians uh, over what we were, uh, what we committed ourselves, I think incredibly stupidly to give them in the 1994 peace deal. Yeah, um, the, the, the whole show is just a show you know he, the, the the lapid's ministry is a continuation of the lapid career in the media because yeah. he, he he apparently he he really can't tell what is public relations and what is actually been done and so you know the, the 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 professionals at the biden administration they have his number down from day one and they've hugged him and and they realized that if they give him photo ops and they and nice words then then it will that will that will be all he needs and he wrote this amazingly silly um article in Aretz outlining his new foreign policy which would be based instead of hostility and suspicion because Netanyahu is morbidly Pessimism. pessimistic it would be it would be based on shared values and friendship and cooperation and what this really means is they have 
they've got him in a Nelson grip because he they've they've made the Israeli government commit to not doing anything about Iran without informing America, which means that we are now a vassal state regarding our most vital interest because what does informing America mean? Means It means that if they veto it, we can't do it. The whole thing with Netanyahu was he said, I'm not showing you my cards and we will take care of Israel's uh, 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 interest regardless of, of what you do. And, and so they've made uh, Lapid into their, in, into their puppet because they gave him the PR that he so craved. These people think that being that being ministers and being prime ministers is a is is, is a CV line. It's something. It's it's a personal achievement and 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 not a calling or a a, a leadership role. Look, I I mean I think that you're right. Again, I think that Lapid has been living in the public eye since he was a boy. I think that his uh, his entire growing up process and and his adulthood have been uh, just uh, receiving plaudits for every stupid thing he says, been told that he's, you know, deep and and important for every one liner that he's able to throw out. You know, I, I mean, he 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 is sort of like a, a freshman at Columbia, my alma mater. You know, we we uh, they have although he never, you know, he dropped out of high school. I don't think he finished 11th grade. And, and it really does show in the vacuity of his of his thinking about everything. And yeah, he just I, I don't know if people know that he's a, he's a laughing stock. There are like there are like videos of him that make complete fun of his like he, he once explained with supreme seriousness that the Israeli had four fathers. Uh, in Hebrew, it's arba'a avot. It's like, it's like the biblical shlosha avot. Only four. And 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 he heard someone say, talk about the Israelis' ancestry and saying forefathers, uh, and and he just this is how his mind worked. He once mentioned Copernicus as a as an ancient Greek. Um, I don't remember if he said astronomer or philosopher. And it's just he he he, he picks. This and that from any from things he popularly heard and he and he knows how to how to how to package them in order to pretend that he knows something. But of course, if you actually know something, then you certainly know he doesn't. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the point is that this is these aren't policies. These are PR stunts. And that really brings us to Kamala Harris. You know, I mean, I mean. I think that he came to Washington because there was no um, I didn't see any reports, you know, in recent weeks that he was planning on coming or that this was a planned trip or that there was any particular reason why the foreign minister would be going to Washington at this time. I think that he was called to Washington for damage control for Kamala Harris after she had that uh, after she had that incredible uh, meeting with the uh, with the anti-Semite at George Mason University. I think that they wanted him he there to give uh, public relations uh, 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 plotted to the vice president who, you know, she just had this ridiculous YouTube that she did with NASA where they hired child actors to pretend to care about what she was saying about, you know, going to outer space or something like that. It was completely it was completely stupid. It isn't, you know, she, she made a complete fool out of herself. Oh, but again. That makes sense. And that makes sense that they, that, that what he said now that he said that she's such a great friend of Israel was not his own idea. He was just called there to, he was handed a script and he just did it. I think so. And, and I'll tell you the other thing that reinforces the sense that they just sort of uh, called him to Washington. They let him talk about Iran and, and whatever else with, with the administration. I mean, there are two things. Uh, the first one is that when he was talking to Kamala Harris, um, the the uh, the line that he gave at the end, you know, he, he, they had their joint appearance. And in the joint appearance, he said, and I'm just going to um, uh, I don't have to give the exact quote, but he he said, we also talked about the new generation of Americans and how to ensure the U.S. Israel alliance lasts for the next hundred years. And he said, you know, this new generation um, doesn't just think about wars and 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 conflicts. They think about they're committed to fighting global warming. They're committed to uh, fighting uh, for for immigration justice. And um, 
for another thing. And, and uh, you know, another sort of tagline for progressive uh, cry, ba- cry bullies. But, you know, he, he, he gave this thing. And I, the, the reason that what struck me about it was that he, by doing that, he indirectly um, was justifying the way that she treated that, that student by suddenly talking about the younger generation when she was just, you know, she just nodded and, and, and backed this young anti-Semite. Um, he was basically telegraphing the message that it was okay, you know, that he totally got it and that, that, that he didn't have any problem with, with the fact that she said you're entitled to your own truth or that your own truth is really important and it can't be repressed. And, uh, and so that was the first thing. And then there was another aspect to this, to the trip that I thought was so appalling, which was that this morning you know, he got there yesterday. <clears throat> and I think most of his, most of his meetings that were last night is real time. So you wake up in the morning and you hear the morning news. And they said that the spokesperson for the state department said that the Abraham Accords were nice, but that they're no replacement for peace with the Palestinians. And here we get to really the, the fourth and last diplomatic uh, diplomatic event of the week, which was the one year anniversary of the Abraham Accords uh, between uh, which, which are the which are the peace deals that Israel signed under the uh, Trump administration. Sorry that I forgot to turn on my phone uh, that uh, Israel um, Israel signed last year with uh, Bahrain and Morocco and the UAE and Sudan. So the um, the the thing about it is that uh, those are those are peace deals that neither Angela Merkel nor the Democrats nor the Israeli left can stand. They just can't stand them. And the reason that they can't stand them, well, there are two reasons. One is because the person who made them or the people who made them were were Bibi Netanyahu and Donald Trump, the, the most hated politicians in the entire world as far as these people are concerned, right? And and the second reason though, that they hate them is because they showed that the peace camps such as it is and the the foreign policy elite of the Western world, you know, from Brussels to Berkeley are, are steeped in anti-Semitism because for over a generation, we talked about this as well as last week, their, their concept of, uh, of uh, peace between Israel and the Palestinians and, and the Arabs has been that peace between Israel and the Arabs has to be held hostage to the PLO, that the PLO and Hamas and all the rest of them have a veto that it's only after Israel has sufficiently appeased them that the rest of the Arabs are going to be making peace with them. The the rest of the Arabs can make peace with them. And the EU is so angry at the Abraham Accords, which, you know, just destroyed this whole narrative that they that they boycotted the signing ceremony at the at the White House. The EU put out this stuttering, angry uh, statement where they could barely disguise how appalled they were by by the fact that the Arabs had gone ahead and made peace with the Jews without without uh, uh, the Hamas's permission. Because just to and, put this uh, in, in, so, a, in a little historical perspective, Carolyn, because the the from from the aftermath of Israel's war of independence, the 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 Palestinians acquired a veto on Israel's relations with the Arab countries, and they've managed to leverage it quite successfully saying that nothing can or should move without Palestinian, um, without supporting the Palestinian cause, which is the so-called right of return and the destruction of Israel. And and when the first peace accord was made, Camp David almost faltered on the Palestinian issue. And so the Camp David Accord is really an accord between Israel and Israel and Egypt with accompanying letters that outline a future autonomy for for uh, the Palestinians, because Anwar Sadat could not could not br- bring it. He couldn't pro- possibly politically. He it, it, it so it, he was proved right because he was assassinated for this peace accord. But he had to pay some lip service to the Palestinians. And now the Europeans and the Obama administration most pronouncedly with Kerry saying, no, 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 with that charming, drooping expression of his, uh, because they tried to leverage all temptations in order to force down Israel's throat the concessions they demanded in the name of the Palestinians. So we had everyone grouped with the Palestinians against us, and now they're doing it again. The, the, what the Lapid, the Lapid Bennett administration has done is that it, it, it 
it brought back the Palestinian veto, it, which puts America on, in, instead of on our side, it puts it on the side opposing us. So, so they've really managed to completely wreck all that Netanyahu carefully diffused all these different little uh, minefields in order to create a net which was then strong enough to, to not, not any individual link, but strong enough together to, to offer Israel a, a, a springboard from which it could stretch out its hand to Arab countries who have realized that the greater danger is Iran and not Israel. And now the, the Biden administration with their return to the Obama realignment, which is really a submission to Iran, have pushed Saudi Arabia. And this is to me like the most recent testimony to how bad things are. Saudi Arabia is reestablishing its relations with Iran because the, if, 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 the, if the Netanyahu matrix is falling apart, then it has no other option. Well, you know, that that's the other thing is that, um, you, you know, it, the Abraham Accords, I mean, Netanyahu was instrumental in this, but was so, was, so was Trump. And so, by the way, was Mike Pompeo and David Friedman. And I was, I had the, uh, I had the pleasure Jason of being, uh, and Jason Greenplay, obviously, uh, uh, Jared Kushner, Jared Kushner. Yeah. Um, and the whole team. So, I mean, this was, but, but, but the concept that guided the Trump administration, and this was the first U.S. administration that recognized reality as the basis or that embraced reality as the basis of their, of their Middle East policies, was, was, I would say, twofold. The first thing that they realized was that, I mean, they realized many things, but the first thing that they, that they did by moving the, by recognizing Jerusalem as, as Israel's capital, and then moving the embassy to Jerusalem and recognizing Israel's sovereignty over the, the Golan, the sovereignty over large swaths of Judea and Samaria, uh, this administration said, look, you know, Israel's not going anywhere, and Israel's powerful, and Israel has justice on its side, and its right to exist is not dependent on anybody uh, accepting it, and peace or no peace uh, Israel's Israel's fine, and we don't have any problem with it. And by the way, there is no such thing as an occupation because Israel also has sovereign rights to Judea and Samaria. Whether they're going to exercise all of them or or only some of them is is up for grabs and negotiations. But you can't claim that uh, Israel's control over Judea and Samaria is is illegal because it's not. So this was a radical approach because the Americans said we're. I mean, and this is what uh, Mike Pence said. In uh, David Friedman opened up the Friedman Center for uh, Peace Through Strength. Uh, in Jerusalem, and I and I had the pleasure uh, with my husband to, to be at the uh, event on Monday night, and uh, he showed this film that he produced with uh, uh, with CBN, I think, about the Abraham Accords, which is really quite amazing. And in the interview that Mike Pence gave to, to gave to Ambassador Friedman, he said, you know, it, it was very important to us to show that we weren't sitting on the, we weren't sitting on the balance, we weren't balancing the Arabs and the and the Israelis. <clears throat> We're on the Israeli side of the table. They're our ally, and we stand with them. We have other allies who are who are Arabs. We have Arab allies as well, and we'll stand with them just as we'll stand with Israel. But we didn't want anybody to think that uh, they could come between us and Israel, and that was really the basis of, of the Abraham Accords. And there's a lot of truth to that. Because, you know, when the Arabs see that the Americans aren't trusting Israel, if Israel can't believe in the United States, then why should they? And aside from that, they then get licensed to, they, they're basically, the, the signal that the United States has been communicating to them throughout the years and is now communicating to them again under the Biden administration is that their war against Israel is justified. Well, if the Americans are saying that their war against Israel is justified, then why would they why would they bury the hatchet? There's no reason to make peace. And that's exactly what the Biden administration is doing. So, you know, you had an Israeli administration under Netanyahu and you had an American administration under Trump that were doing the exact opposite of what everybody always said that you had to do. And as a result, they got opposite results. So everybody who says that you have to appease terrorists, that you have to appease the Palestinians who will never be appeased because the only reason that they exist as a nation is, is because Israel exists as a country. And the minute that Israel gets destroyed, they won't be 
either a nation or people or or anything else anymore. They'll just be part of a of a you know of a general pan pan Arab or pan Islamic uh, revolution and jihad. So, but but that's neither here. The point is that everybody failed to bring peace, including Merkel, right? Including Kerry, including Obama, including Clinton, including Bush, uh, both Bushes, including everybody. Because they all said that everything had to happen only after the PLO was appeased. And Trump said, who cares about the PLO? Israel is a powerful nation. It's a US ally. It's an ally for anybody who wants to fight Iran. So if you want to make peace, make peace. If you're not, who cares? And then everybody wanted to make peace. So, you know, what we're having today is the exact opposite from both the Israeli government and from the US administration. And that's why things have gotten so dangerous and 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 bad. And I think that, uh, you know, it, the, the stark contrast between the Abraham Accords and, and the sort of three big diplomatic things this week, Merkel's visit, the Jordanian uh, water uh, giveaway, and uh, Lapid's ridiculous visit to Washington, you know, when you see these in contrast to the Abraham Accords, you see just how far things are deteriorating and have have really shifted over the past year. But that really brings us, I think, to the last thing that I wanted to talk about this hour, which is the fight within within the Israeli right about this government, which, you know, is, you know, and and how how the media, because it's really being fought between between people on the right, largely in the media um, and how this government should be covered and how we should be looking at yeah, you're Lapid. So I'm going to give the one side and then you give you give the other side because you're one of the most outspoken people on that side. And I have to say, I, I, I support you. Um, I'm, you know, it's my fight, too. But but the, the way that that uh, sort of you might say the legitimizers or something, the rhinos of Israel are presenting this situation is, look, you know, yeah, it's true. Uh, there are problems with the government, but, you know, we were stuck in a deadlock for two years, Bibi couldn't make a government and this was the only way we could avoid elections. And, um, you know, you got to take them at their word. They said that they're credible and, and you just got to you got to go, got to go to the events that Naftali hosts and you treat it, you know, like a straight news story. You got to go to the events that Ayala Chaked hosts and you got to treat it as a, as a straight news story and, and so on and so forth. Everything that they do, whether it's in regards to Israel's immigration laws or Israel's foreign policy, Israel's legal system, Eagle's economics, uh, you know, our budgets, our health, our health policies regarding Corona specifically, all of these things just treat it like a normal thing, just as you would treat any other government. And you're looking at it from a different direction. Yeah, b- because I think that that <clears throat> what what Bennett did is such a violation of the basic rules of honor and trust in a demo- on which democracy rests. It doesn't rest only on laws. It rests on conventions. And what he did was he took an electorate that was right of Likud, and he, by, by throwing it all the way to the left, he completely corrupted what was the public will or the approximation of the public will as seen as an election. We have a, a right-leaning electorate and we have a radical extreme left-wing government, which is also post-national, post-modern and dependent on a huge bribe and dependent for its survival on the local branch of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood or the, 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 the movement, the Israeli movement affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. They, it's, a, it's a complete selling of all the major um, uh, foundations of the Zionist um, enterprise. And he- you know, we talk about but we talk about this every week. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm in full agreement with you about this. We talk about this every week, but it always, you know, for me, it, it goes down to two things. One is from a moral perspective, you're absolutely right. I totally agree with you. I mean, in fact, I argue the same thing you do that we, you know, that this is this is an atrocity. This is a crime against democracy. You know, this is taking uh, taking the letter of the law and and tearing up and and burning its spirit. Because it's true that you can do what Naftali did. You can extort the the premiership and form a government with the radical left and the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, under law, it's totally legal. Everything that he did is is permissible under law. 
or I mean, there are arguments to say they aren't, but you know, in general, you could it would be a hard argument to make in in court, even if it wasn't an Israeli court, but an actual, you know, representative democratic court. But anyway, having said all of that in one run-on sentence, you, you, we also um, have a problem, which is that in order to form a government, you need sixty-one mandates, and we had four government, four successive elections in which. Netanyahu failed to get but, the but, but, uh, Stani, support of 61 know, members now, of Kelly, Knesset. But now we know, and, and people watching, our outside, watching us outside Israel may not, Naftali Bennett was, he, he prevented a right-wing government. He could have said, I'm with Netanyahu or going to another round of elections. And then the Gidon Saar uh, uh, party, Tikva Hadasha, New Hope, would would know that another round of election and it would completely collapse. So he had the leverage and he didn't do anything. We, we later learned that he was waiting on the fence. He didn't help Netanyahu. He didn't participate in the negotiations because he waited for the opportunity to extort the premiership from the left. And now what we are facing is it's the left has a massive journalistic campaign to say, okay, he just he 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 he, he went back on one of his, on, a, on an election promise, as all politicians do. No, this is Bernie Madoff. This is this is a heist. He just stole a whole block of voters from the right and gave the left that couldn't win the election he gave them the 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 premiership so the so the now now the 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 left wing uh, controlled media is whitewashing that i guess you can't say whitewashing anymore we can whitewashing they're whitewashing this and 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 now there is a faction of the right wing media who is also whitewashing this and first we need to explain why so i'll just say a few words because in my view the, the explanation is strictly sociological. They are Ashkenazim. They are still mourning the, the collapse of what we, we called the historical alliance between the re religious national right and Mapai, the, uh, the labor Zionism. And they split over the 67 war in the territories. And, and they've joined Likud, but they never liked Likud because Likud is a, how would you say, Amami, Caroline? It's too common. It's all the common folks. Yeah, you know, it's, it's Sephardic it, Jews. Right? Yeah, the, it, it's too low, bro. Working class. It's working so, class. Yeah, so they're, they, they're yearning, they're pining to belonging to the elites because that's how they see themselves. They're the right kind of people. They're idealistic and they're Ashkenazi and they're educated in the West. And so now they've succumbed to this temptation. And the reason I got into these fights, and I, I, I'm not sure yet what the, what, what the repercussions will be. I, I certainly can't work in those newspapers anymore. So I've limited myself in, 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 in that term. But, I, but, but And I've been, I guess, people said I was very rude in, 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 in I don't think in, you were calling rude. Him. But, but I think, I, I, I do think I was very blunt, but that was part of the point. I mean, I also have a, a flawed character. I know I like Twitter fights, but but this time it it had it it had a, a reason behind it, and the reason is that by using this slippery language, by coding sugar coating everything, they're trying to sell us the the worst fraud in the history of Israeli politics, the worst betrayal of an electorate, and a government which is which is dependent on the Muslim Brotherhood, which wants to dismantle Israel. And they're trying to sell this as normality. Lapid, it's Lapid's words. We're back to normality. There's nothing normal about this twisted coalition of anti-patriots who is bent on, on dismantling the Zionist enterprise. And we're supposed to say, oh, well, you know, their argument, their pros and cons. No, they're not pros and cons. This is mm -hmm. an illegitimate violation of the basic rules of trust. And this is why I think, and I don't have to convince you since you also have been known to be blunt when needed, shall I say? Um, and I think it's, it's, it's time that we be clear and blunt and always when all these people keep thinking of themselves intellectuals, they're Emile Zola, Jacuz, they will call out the, the Dreyfus affair. So 
so so it's it's time to to really take an example from Emil Zola. Modestly, I'm not Emil Zola, but 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 there are times where where bluntness means clarity, and and we should follow these examples and be be blunt and and in the way isolate them because I, I have a lot of arguments as you know on the right with people are saying to me that's a beautiful Hebrew expression you're, you're shooting, shooting in, into the tank you're shooting inside the tank like you're shooting your own your 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 own troops but they're not our own if they are if they are now whitewashing a go an anti-Zionist government and giving it a a, a a halo of legit of of right wing legitimacy, then they then they don't belong. They don't belong. I know, here. but you know, there's a problem, and I don't know how to square this. So I, I totally agree with you, and I say the same thing. First of all, anybody who calls you rude, I mean, you know, this is what we're seeing with the whole cancel culture and the whole silencing of debate in the United States, is that you know they they claim that we're being rude as a way to silence us, as a way to take us, you know, to distract from what we're trying to say. So we have to be nice. We have to put, oh, don't, we didn't mean to insult you. You know, I don't even know what that means anymore because now everything political, everything personal has become political anyway because of, you know, because of the Marxist uh, control over the discourse. But I, I think, you know, we see this in the United States as well. We saw it in the 2020 elections and, um, and, and the big thing that's horrible and that, you know, from a practical perspective, we have to figure out how to deal with is that, the rhinos, the never Trumpers, and the and the uh, and the sort of bigots in in Israel who are, who are acting in the same way for social reasons is that you know so much of the betrayal really is about class, right? And 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 it's crazy to talk about it, you know, like in Marxist terms of class, but it's it's about social classes and about saying, I don't want to be part of this. It's sort of a revolt, like you said, against the working class that are in their political and ideological camp. We don't want to be with them. We want to be with the fancy pants. And finally, because of Bennett, who spent his entire life apparently sucking up to uh, the ruling class on the left, uh, they're finally getting to be loved. And so you see the most important uh, media organs on the right uh, Makori Shon, the newspaper that I started my journalistic career in, and Arut Sheva, and you see them both legitimizing this government. And it's really quite stunning and, and terrible. And in the United States, you saw that with National Review, obviously with the with the uh, with the Weekly Standard, which you know I do miss in the sense that it used to be a great newspaper, it used to be a great magazine. I enjoyed reading it and then it became unreadable and then it went away. But I mean, you know, these were these were institutions on the right in the United States and they were important. And now they've become either, now that they're gone or they've become difficult to understand what they want from you. And I don't know as a practical matter, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time. The United States has one more election. And then basically, you know, if, if the Republicans aren't able to, to win back the country in 2022 and then in 2024, I don't know what's going to become in the United States. I mean, you have you have the attorney general declaring war on parents and and fighting it and fighting prosecuting a war against parents on behalf of cultural Marxism in classrooms. And and um, here in Israel, we don't have a lot of time. These people really are endangering us. The things that they're doing, whether it's with the BDS groups or and the campaigns against Israel to delegitimize their very right to exist, whether it's empowering the Arabs of Israel, who, you know, you've said before, and I think you're right, we may end up, because of what they're doing, having to fight a, a, a civil war against against Israeli Arab citizens who have now been empowered to believe that they can destroy Israel with no penalties. We're probably uh, not going to start and, such a war, but 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 they they may instigate it. Yeah. Well, but the, I mean, we've already had one uh one campaign of Hamas that was joined by Israeli Arabs who who burned Israeli cities and launched pogroms against Israeli Jews. Um, and then, you know, you have Iran. We don't have a lot of time. And when you look at the kind of, of destruction that the right intellectual base is is causing to to the country by by giving legitimacy to this sort of thing, you really do have to wonder. So I have to say, you know, uh, I applaud you for for being, you know, rude on Twitter on Thank this. You, and, and and the problem is, is that you always put these things out and get attacked right in the middle of me attacking somebody else on something completely different. And I don't want to distract from the importance of what I'm saying by going to war against uh, against McCory Shown as well. But I will, don't worry. And uh, I don't know, but we really, I mean, one of the things that one of our big challenges is to figure out how to win this.
and it's very bad because the stakes couldn't be higher and time is time you know time is precious and we don't have any to waste i think there will so. be a rude awakening if we and, and, I, and with with the one of the looming catastrophes i'm sad to say this i'm not i i, I don't subscribe to the leninist idea that it would be it's it's better to get worse first or no. it will get worse before it will get better because we don't know that it would get better after it gets worse. Well, but, we just have to keep fighting the fight and let God yeah, take care but, of the but rest, my, I guess. But my feeling is that, that, that we are, the way they are dismantling our, our most important foundations, it's something is going to give and something is going to collapse. And, and, it's gonna, and, and, and if that happens, they'll be washed away. We'll be left without, a, like the Oslo like the Oslo paradigm, but we'll be left with someone and, and we need someone like Netanyahu in order to start in order to start rebuilding. All right. Well, we're going to rebuild and and all of you watching us and listening to us are going to help us by, by subscribing, getting, by subscribing <laughs> uh, for an introductory offer of zero dollars uh, for a subscription. And uh, the, the and first decade share- is free. <laughs> Shush. And and you and you share with all of your friends and family. And, and once we get up to, you know, that critical mass, we'll start charging you about one hundred and fifty dollars per show. Right. That's, that's <laughs> exactly. Fine. That's the second decade. <laughs> yeah. So that's later on. But don't worry about that for now. Just subscribe, <laughs> share, get out the word. Let's fight this fight because we need to. Everything's everything depends on it. So take care. God bless. See you next week. See you next week. Bye bye. Bye.